anyway. The term, who's your daddy, has become a part of our cultural vernacular over the last 30 or 40 years. It wasn't introduced in the movie, Remember the Titans, but it was really popularized in the movie, Remember the Titans. And I don't know how many of you have seen that movie, but it's based on a true story about a high school uh, integration, a high school that was being integrated for the first time in Virginia in the early 1970s. And they brought over the black head coach from the all-black school to be the coach at this school. And it wasn't received very well initially, and particularly even by some of the players and the parents. And Denzel Washington plays the, uh, the coach, and, uh, well, this is what happened. Who's your daddy? That popularized it. And uh, I'm not going to ask tonight who's your daddy, but our text is basically going to ask who's your mama. Now, you might expect, given my sense of humor, for me to open with some your mama jokes. But I'm not, because those are really more insults than they are jokes. You know what I mean? They really start with like, your mama is so dumb that, or your mama is so ugly that, or and it's really insults uh, wrapped up as jokes. I'm only going to say one thing about your mama, and that is your mama is so wonderful that she brought you into the world. Amen? You wouldn't be here without her. I always love when athletes are asked, what they're thankful for, and they said, my mama, because I wouldn't be here without her. Well, no, you wouldn't. I mean, literally, that's true. No, you wouldn't. But I am going to ask about who's your mama tonight, because as we have been studying through the book of Galatians, if we've made our way to the back part of chapter 4, we've been talking about how Paul is trying to get these churches in Galatia to remember that they were saved by grace and they were Christians by grace, and that these Judaizer teachers had tried to bring in different elements of legalism in the Old Testament law in order to try to change them into becoming Jews, in effect. And they, these Jewish teachers, these Judaizers, were proud of the fact that they were sons of Abraham. That's how they often refer to themselves by those three words, sons of Abraham. So what Paul is going to do here in the latter chat part of chapter 4 is he's going to take a sarcastic poke at their pride. He's going to remind them that Abraham had, in a sense, two wives. Sarah and Hagar, the Egyptian slave. And he had two sons. Not just Isaac, but also Ishmael. And he really digs the needle in, in the text, by saying that forcing Christians back into the bondage of legalism is really like saying that Hagar is their spiritual mother, not Sarah. It's really unusual for Paul to do this kind of thing. Jesus often spoke this way in parables and stories. But for Paul to do this, not normal. Tell me, you who want to live under the law, do you know what the law actually says? The scriptures say that Abraham had two sons. And from his slave wife, one from his freeborn wife. The son of the slave wife was born in a human attempt to bring about the fulfillment of God's promise. But the son of the freeborn wife was born as God's own fulfillment of his promise. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. Now that's the key phrase for you to understand here. There's a reason why Paul is saying this. It's not just to remind them Abraham had children by two different women or that there were two different sons. This is the reason he's using this as an illustration or an allegory. And that is, they serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The old covenant and the new covenant. The old law and the new law. The law and the grace. These two women serve as an illustration of God's two covenants. The first woman, Hagar, represents Mount Sinai where people received the law that enslaved them. And now Jerusalem is just like Mount Sinai in Arabia, Arabia. 
because she and her children live in slavery to the law. The other woman, Sarah, represents the heavenly Jerusalem. She is the free woman, and she is our mother. As Isaiah said, rejoice, O childless woman. You have never given birth. Break into a joyful shout. You who have never been in labor, for the desolate woman now has more children than the woman who lives with her husband. And that was true. There were more Arabs, and I'll mention, I'll say why in just a minute, than there were Jews. And you, dear brothers and sisters, are children of the promise, just like Isaac. But you are now being persecuted by those who want you to keep the law. Mm. They were being, the term he used is persecuted. Christians in the church of Galatia were being persecuted. He called it. Just as Ishmael, the child born by human effort, persecuted Isaac, the child born by the power of the Spirit. What do the scriptures say about that? Get rid of the slave and her son, for the son of the slave woman will not share the inheritance with the free woman's son. So, dear brothers and sisters, we are not children of the slave woman. We are children of the free woman. Jesus loved teaching parables and analogies and metaphors. Paul was a great teacher, but as you read through all of his epistles, he almost never used a story, and I don't think he ever used a parable. Paul was a spiritual straight shooter and usually just stated the unvarnished truth. But this is one of those rare occasions where Paul uses an allegory. He uses the story of Sarah and Hagar, which is one of the juiciest stories in the Bible. It has all the elements of a modern soap opera or a movie. So let's get the skinny on the actual story and be reminded of it, and then we can understand why he said it is an illustration of the two covenants that we've been talking about here in the book of Galatians. In order to understand the point Paul is trying to make, you have to understand the background of the story between Abraham and Sarah and Hagar. It all started when God entered into a covenant relationship with Abraham first, and then all of his descendants. God promised to bless Abraham and his descendants so they would be a blessing to all nations. One night, Abraham was by himself out in the land of Ur, minding his own family business, when God says to him, Abraham, I want you to look up into the sky, and I want you to see the stars because I'm going to give you more descendants than all the stars in the sky. That was prescient by God, by the way, pre-science by God, because God knows, as God knew then what we know now, there are billions of stars. Billions of stars. And so that was God's promise to Abraham and to his wife Sarah. So Abraham got excited because that meant Sarah was going to get pregnant soon, except it didn't happen. They waited and waited and waited, no child. They waited 25 years, no child. Abraham's 85 years old, Sarah's 75 years old. She says, this isn't going to happen. We've got to help God out. And so she had a younger handmaiden named Hagar, who was her slave, and she hatched a plot that some have called the Hagar Solution. She said, Abe, I've got an idea. God isn't giving us children, but he promised that we would have kids and grandkids, so he probably wants us to make it happen. Why don't you sleep with my handmaiden, Hagar, and let her get pregnant and give you a son? Abraham, known as the father of the faithful, should have known better. Abraham should have said, no, no. We're going to wait on God's timing and trust God. He promised us a child, and I believe him. But instead, he looked at Sarah, and he looked at Hagar and said, Well, if you insist, dear. And so, that didn't turn out well. 
Hagar had the child, and it was maybe, maybe the second biggest mistake in all human history. Now, the first biggest mistake happened where? Garden of Eden, where sin entered into the world. But this very well could have been the second biggest mistake in all of human history. Because Hagar did become pregnant, and there were three terribly bad consequences of the Hagar solution, some of which we are still experiencing nearly 3,000 years later today. The first bad experience was you had two jealous women. From that point on, Sarah and Hagar became enemies. Hagar must have gloated over the fact that she was carrying Abraham's son that Sarah couldn't do. Sarah was barren. And so they started fighting. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 16 that Sarah abused Hagar, mistreated Hagar. Hagar ran away, and only when God met her out in the wilderness and said, go back, did she return and deal with the mistreatment. The second terrible consequence of the Hagar solution then was two competing sons. She had her son, and Abraham named him Ishmael, which means God is listening or it can mean God is watching. And it can even mean God is watching continually. Now remember, I've told you this many times before. In that day and age, names were very important. They were often descriptive of the person. Very, very important. So, Ishmael is born. He's the only son of Abraham. And you can only imagine the, the hostility and the seething that continues through the years to develop between the two jealous women. And when the angels told Sarah that she also was going to have a baby when she was 90 years old, she did what any 90-year-old woman would do. She laughed. And then she got pregnant. And God told Abraham to name the child Isaac, which means laughter. I've always said those who don't think God has a sense of humor do not understand God. Can you imagine every morning when Sarah is calling laughter to breakfast? Laughter, your breakfast is ready. Because that's what his name literally meant. Every day, she would be reminded of how she laughed at God's promise. When Isaac was three years old, 17-year-old Ishmael began tormenting and abusing him like Isaac's mother had been doing his mother. See, Ishmael had assumed for all these years he was going to receive his daddy's inheritance. And if you would have asked him, who's your daddy? He would have said, Abraham is. Suddenly he sees a rival. And so Ishmael begins mocking little Isaac. And you might say, he laughed at laughter. The Bible says he mocked him. He laughed at laughter. And when Sarah saw that, she blew her stack. And she went to Abraham and said, that woman's got to go. That boy's got to go. It doesn't matter that he is your biological son. He's got to go. Paul referenced that in the text we just looked at in Galatians chapter 4 when he said the slave woman and the son of the slave woman had to be put out. He references that. Kick them both out and do it today. And though it broke Abraham's heart, once again he said, yes, dear, if you insist. Which leads us to the third terrible consequence 
of the Hagar solution. And that is two hostile races. I mean, these boys are going to hate one another, and the descendants of Ishmael are going to become the Arab people, and of course the descendants of Isaac are going to become the Israelites, the Jews. And from that day until this day, there has been no peace among them. Look it up. Look up history. From that day to this day, absolutely no peace between the descendants of Ishmael and the descendants of Isaac. The Arabians gave birth to Islam, and radical Muslims hate Israel with a passion. Would do anything they could to destroy them, did through the centuries, in fact. And now you know why. All the turmoil in the Middle East is a family feud. When Israel was born, God made a prediction about him. He said to Abraham, this son of yours will be a wild man as untamed as a wild donkey. He will raise his fist against everyone and everyone will be against him. Yes, he will live in open hostility against all his relatives. I don't have to be a historian or a history teacher to tell you, just go back and look for yourselves. That has been true all through history. It is still true today. That's not a racial or ethnic slur in any way. That's just the truth. And that's just what the Bible and God had said would happen. And they are not only hostile toward Israel, they are constantly killing each other. Just look what happened the minute we left Iraq. They started fighting among each other. When we leave Afghanistan, there will be some of that too. Syria. Syria is an absolute mess that nobody can resolve right now. Because that has simply always been true. God predicted that Ishmael's descendants would live in hostility toward all his brothers, all his relatives, not just Isaac and the Jews. And it has been a reality. And the reason all these nations are committed to the destruction of Israel goes all the way back to the story of Hagar and Sarah. That's the background to this passage that Paul is writing to the Christians in Galatia. So what was his point? He wasn't talking literally here in Galatians chapter 4 about the story of Sarah and Hagar. He is talking about how it applied to the two ways of salvation. Work your way or the grace way. And he said it straight out. He was comparing it to these two covenants. He said, this relationship between Sarah and Hagar, Ishmael and Isaac, the two nations, is an illustration of the difference between the two covenants. The one I gave you when I established the churches in Galatia that is based on grace and the one that the Judaizers are trying to bring back in, which is based on the old covenant and law. Wow. Wow. So Ishmael, which means God is watching, God sees, God is paying attention, represents the belief that you can make yourself more attractive or more lovable by God by doing certain things because God is watching everything that you do. Or, that, and this is the way mostly I grew up, that you can make yourself more attractive to God by abstaining from certain things and making yourself look better to God. His name implies God is always watching. Like a cop sitting beside the road. Imagine if every single time, every road you drove on, there was a cop sitting there with radar. I mean, you better make sure your speed is down or the cop will come after you. Legalism says you better be good or God is going to come after you. He's going to come down and 
get you. What a miserable way to live. On the other hand, Isaac represents the supernatural. (laughs) Born to a woman when she was 90 and her husband was 100. And then instructed by God to be named Laughter. What did Paul say? This is an illustration of the two covenants. It was a miracle birth that had no chance of happening apart from the divine intervention of God. What does that sound like? Why, it sounds like grace. (laughs) That sounds like grace. I can't earn it. I never will deserve it. It has no chance of happening other than the miracle intervention of God. Paul says it's a contrast between the two covenants. That's what it is. Ishmael was very proud of being the firstborn son. And he ridiculed and mocked little Isaac. And legalism can produce pride. Jesus told a story about that in the New Testament. The parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Where the Pharisee went up into the temple and said, Lord, I thank thee that I'm not like other men. And he's looking right at this other guy. (laughs) And the other guy simply says, a tax collector. As we talked about Sunday, maybe the most wicked sinner among them. Who approached God and said, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. (laughs) Contrast between two covenants again. The Pharisees trying to keep the law. God's watching every second, every move, everything I do good, everything I do bad. The tax collector is watching for grace. Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Paul's saying here in Galatians chapter 4, which are you to the church in Galatia? He would say it to us today as well. And Ishmael and Hagar lived with Abraham for 17 years, but when Isaac came along, there was not going to be room for two wives and two sons. So Ishmael and Hagar were kicked out, and that may seem harsh, but if you take that comparison again with what Paul is saying, this is given you as an illustration of the two covenants. Law and grace cannot exist at the same time. You're either saved by law or you're saved by grace. You either are sustained by law or you're sustained by grace. Not not my words. Paul's words. That's what he said. These are examples of the two. Either believe that there are things you can do to make God happy, or you say every day, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. Keep me from sin. Keep me from sin but give me your grace. You know, there's an old song that we used to sing, and we still sing it occasionally, I think. Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. That's the grace song. Here's the law version of it. Jesus paid it some. I must pay the rest. Sin still leaves a crimson stain. So I must do my best. It's an illustration of the differences between the two covenants. I just wonder, what would it be like this week for you as a Christian if you lay aside 
and threw out every legalistic thought you had? What if you just spent the entire week enjoying the fact that God loves you in spite of the fact that sometimes you mess up? Go ahead. Kick Ishmael out of your tent. <laughs> That's exactly what Paul said. Here in Galatians chapter 4. So that you can be a true son of Abraham with the right mother, spiritually speaking, Sarah. Now, to me, there are some obvious applications of these 10 verses. The first one is, God always keeps his promises. God promised Abraham that he would have thousands of descendants, and Abraham and Sarah showed a lack of faith in that promise when they launched the Hagar solution. And God has made promises to us as well. There are so many promises that God has made to us. Just open the New Testament and read through the promises that he has made to us. A promise of peace, a promise of comfort, a promise of assurance of salvation. So many promises he has made to us. Worry about we will not have peace, we will not have enough to make it or to get by, or we will not be good enough to go to heaven is a sin. It's a sin because in effect it's saying I don't trust God. God's not telling the truth. God won't keep his promises. What's well, another obvious application? God is not in a hurry. He is not on our time schedule. We sometimes try to take shortcuts just like Hagar did, just like Sarah and Abraham did. We're in an instant download culture. We want instant gratification. We're in a hurry. But God isn't. A day to him is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. That means you haven't even lived a tenth of a day on God's timetable. When I was growing up, my mother was a pretty good cook in some things. She didn't make a lot of stuff, but some things that she made, she made really well. She was very good at fried chicken. And I'd watch her roll up the chicken, and, or cut up the chicken and roll it in the batter, and then the Crisco started popping in the old black cast iron skillet, and, and then she would put that bread chicken on top of there. And I would go in, and I couldn't wait to eat it, and I would say, Let's eat it. Let's eat it now. She would say, no, it's not cooked just right on the inside. And to me, it looked like it was cooked great because I could only see on the outside. But she knew in her timing when it was going to be just right on the inside too. We think because we can see the outside of things, we know as much as God. We know what God's timing ought to be. No, nope. God isn't in a hurry. We want God to do things now. We're like the guy who prayed, Lord, give me patience and give it to me right now. That's the way we are. But just remember that with God... Timing is more important than time. And his timing is impeccable. And here's the biggest takeaway to me from this passage in Galatians chapter 4. If I try to replace God's plan with my own, it, there are certain to be unpleasant circumstances. God had a plan for Abraham and Sarah, but they substituted their plan for God's plan. And we're still suffering the consequences of their mistake. The Hagar solution is a perfect example of how dangerous it is to believe that God helps those who help themselves. The Bible never says that. <laughs> 
says the opposite. God helps those who realize they are helpless to help themselves. You know, Frank Sinatra made a song very popular. It was not written by him. It was written by somebody else. But uh, he made the song My Way very popular, and you probably can't read it on the screen. So the last lines of the song say, for what is a man, what has he got, if not himself, then he has naught. The right to say the things he feels and not the words of one who kneels. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. You know what's interesting about this song? This song over the last 20 or 30 years has become very popular for atheists, for people who make a point of saying they reject God, they reject His Word and they reject His will, to play at their funerals. Did you know that? Many atheists have this song played at their funeral. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. The right to say the things he feels and not the words of one who kneels. Because the Bible says, one day every knee will bow before Jesus and confess him as Lord. The record shows I took the blows and did it my way. Who's your daddy? God. Who's your mama? If your spiritual mama is Hagar, then you're in bondage to religion that dictates that you have to do something to be stay saved and to stay saved. If your spiritual mama is Sarah, and you are a true son of Abraham, then you have accepted the grace way. And you can truly say, your father, your daddy, is in heaven. 